Because conflict is generally just a difference of opinion. You know, I believe this, somebody else believes that. I believe this very strongly, you believe that very strongly. That's super cool. In your experience, who handles conflict better, women or men? <laughs> this is such a casual question that you throw in there. But this is not going to cause any issues if I answer one way or another. How dare you ask that question, Vlad? Women definitely handle conflict better. Nowadays, companies hire more women CEOs than the men. Whoever is watching this podcast, we are looking for a new CEO for our company. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Daryl is a seasoned leadership coach with 15 plus years of experience helping tech leaders elevate their confidence, communication, and leadership skills. Known for his no-nonsense approach, he empowers leaders to build high-performing teams and maintain fulfilling relationships, ensuring they thrive both professionally and personally. Trust is fine if it's allowing us to momentarily achieve something, it pushes us to get something, we have to hit a deadline, that's super cool. But it's when it just layers on top and we never get a break, that's when it becomes an issue. So when it comes to, to, to leadership, I think there's, there's being vulnerable, saying that you messed up, and this starts, sort of starts helping to have these types of conversations. I think a woman was asking men, so who do you talk to when you struggle? And every single person that responds, I don't talk to anybody. I don't have anybody to talk to. The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. Here are your hosts, Aniette Chowdhury and Vlad Suleiman. Daryl, welcome to our show. Thank you for having me. So today we're going to dive into three big topics that many of us deal with, but always, you know, we don't like to speak about it. The perfectionism, conflict and depression. And uh, this can really shape our experiences, especially for those pushing hard, hard, you know, hard to succeed. And I mm -hmm. feel it. I mean, I can feel it myself. I'm sure Annette also sometimes feel it because we're also trying to push it. So uh, let's start by talking about something that a lot of high achievers wrestle with, which is perfectionism. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like a double-edged sword that can drive you to greatness and but also can, uh, you know, wear you down. So my question to you is, how do you help leaders recognize their pursuit of perfection uh, that is becoming, you know, counterproductive? Yeah, it's a, it's a big one. And I, I'm going to say that it's something I've experienced, but I've seen many times with other leaders is the, the first one is when you just, you have this sense of increased stress and anxiety. So you just, because the constant pushing to achieve means that you're just putting yourself under more and more pressure. And as you said, it's, it's fine up to a certain point in time, but then once it gets past that tipping point, then it just leads to this stress that doesn't recalibrate itself because stress is fine if it's allowing us to momentarily achieve something it pushes us to get something we have to hit a deadline that's super cool and then if it drops back down to our normal level then super fine but it's when it just layers on top and we never get a break that's when it becomes an issue how do you understand that it's layering off and it's not just you know the small stress and that's the that's the million dollar question is how do you notice how do other people notice uh, oftentimes it's going to manifest itself physically um, I mean, you talked about depression, that's, that's one end of it. That's when it gets really to the, the other end of the level. But then we talk about burnout. I think this is when, yes, high achievers are pushing and pushing and pushing. And then at some point your body just says, sorry, I can't do this anymore. Uh, I mean, in, in my case, I did actually have burnout many years ago, but I didn't actually realize it at the time because I was, this is when I was teaching, I didn't have my own classroom. And so I was constantly, because I wanted to be there for my students, I had to run around all day and set up different classrooms and be there and prepare all the materials. So I would get in super early, I'd finish super late. And I didn't realize, but it was only until a member of my team said, mm. right, they sat me down and said, you need to do something different. And I was like, why, what's going on? Uh, you've lost, I hadn't even noticed I'd lost weight because I wasn't really eating well during the day. I was just doing, doing, doing. And then in the evening I was doing, doing, doing. And so I didn't notice. So it took actually somebody else to sit me down and notice. 
because I just wanted everything to be right and I wanted to deliver my best. And so sometimes we don't realize it ourselves and it takes somebody else to realize it for us or recognize it for us. Do you think if you take it uh, percentage-wise, how many times do you think we realize it ourselves? <laughs> I think as, as it's going to be... Time we're not. Yeah, that's going to be, it's going to be a lot of my answers today. It depends. It depends how self-aware you are. So now, I mean, this was how many, how, how do I know? 20 years, this is 20 years ago. And I didn't have the same level of self-awareness that I have now. So now I'm right. very conscious about putting certain habits into place. I recognize when I'm feeling a certain way and then I'll take a step back. I'll take my foot off the gas or I'll recalibrate. But I would say, yes, most people, most of the time don't realize it. Mm-hmm. So would you recommend people to surround themselves with, you know, with people who can advise them when they, when they see that they're burning out? Yeah. And I think it's just an honesty piece, you know, just to say, if you're, Hey, you look like shit, um, (laughs) as opposed to, as opposed to ignoring it, or it is something different, or you've put on weight, uh, or, I mean, and I know these types of things are challenging for people to say, because you always want to, we have this whole impression of ourselves. We want to be nice people. We want to be good people. So we don't want to say unpleasant things to other people, even if they're our friends. So it's really having that, that extreme level of honesty, but authenticity and integrity at the same time to call somebody out and say, Hey, you know, Vlad, you're, you're looking a little bit tired at the moment. Everything. Okay. And that's all it has to be, but that can provide the opportunity for a conversation to start and that person to reflect on their behaviors themselves. And what I think also important is to say that to ask what's going on and not to give opinion right away. This is, I think the huge one because I hate when people give me opinion without me asking them. Well, I think that's universal, right? (laughs) Yeah. And, and that's, and that's the balance. You know, I can make an observation saying you look tired, but then my question would be, how is everything? What's changed? Is everything okay? And then just go in with curiosity, as, as you rightly said, don't assume, but ask. Yeah. I know there is a growing conversation also about the connection between the perfectionism and mental health issues like anxiety and depression. And I was doing a research before the interview and I found interesting thing that um, one research showed that individuals with high level of perfectionism is significantly more likely to experience depression and anxiety. For example, uh, the people with generalized anxiety disorder often display more perfectionist traits than uh, the average person. Yeah. And another study shows that uh, the perfectionism of any kind lead to feelings of social disconnection, which is strongly likely to depressive symptoms. And with that statistics in mind, what do you think, uh, what's your take on the impact of perfectionism and mental health? Well, I can probably say that I would fit into those categories or will have fit into those categories in the past. This was something that I, that I struggled with for like 10 or 15 years. Mm-hmm. I didn't recognize it until a few years ago. I did a course on mental health first aid. And then looking back at my my youth, as it were, I realized, oh, okay, that's what I struggled with because my parents were very demanding. Uh, So my mother, Asian background, generally very demanding parents, and they expected a lot of me. And a lot of it came from the fact that they also compared me to other people. Mm. So I had this feeling of not being good enough from a very early age. So everything I tried to do, I tried to do either right or I didn't really do it at all. So I was very focused on not getting things wrong. So I would definitely say I had this trait of trying to be perfect. And the problem was that if I, if I wasn't, then I was anxious about it. And I was just afraid of getting things wrong. And that stopped me from trying things. It maybe led me to not do certain things, but I would say absolutely that I would fit into those categories in uh, all the statistics that you put down there. This podcast is sponsored by Argo Prep, an award-winning educational publisher serving over a million students nationwide. If you're a kindergarten to eighth grade teacher or principal, be sure to check out our supplementary workbooks to get your students ready for standardized state testing. We cover all subjects from kindergarten to eighth grade. Use the coupon code AVENUE for a 25% discount off of all purchase orders. Visit us today at argoprep.com slash store. 
how does one get away from that? Because that is a very common story. And I bring that up because I, I was brought up the same exact way. I was brought up with very strict parents and overbearing mm. and overprotective parents. And so I, 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 I see the similarities in our story. And yeah, it had to be right. And yeah, I can see how that drives to perfectionism. And so it, it seems like you've discovered way uh, healthy ways to battle that later on in your life but for those who mm. may be listening and you know especially it's very common in our community this this whole notion of you know very strict parents and uh like how does one get away from that how does one start living the life or making the choices they want to do for themselves as opposed to you know always drowning with the with this fear of hey if this is not right you know, I'm afraid mm. of what my parents will think or whatever the case is. But this is a common story. Yeah, the parental expectation was was, was a big one for me, you know, disappointing your parents and uh, yeah. not being a good son and, you know, to the other extreme, bringing shame on the family. Somebody asked me this question the other day and I had to really think what was one of the key indicators for me. You talked about it there and yet about getting away from it. Mm -hmm. I think distancing yourself physically mm -hmm. is, is definitely one way. I know it's not always a solution, but for me, I actually moved to Russia. Um, so I think just getting out of that environment <laughs> created some sort of mental distance from me where I was able to reshape. And I then went to a country I could be who I wanted to be. And it allowed me to formulate my personality in a, in a different way that I wasn't beholden to that element of my past. Now, I know not everybody can do that, but just simply the recognition of, okay, these are somebody else's wishes. These right. are somebody else's desires. This is what somebody else wants for me. What do I actually want for myself? And then if you can't move the environment, then find people who can see you for who you want to be and will support you irrespective mm. of your choices. You know, it's not you're a good person because you did X, Y, and Z. It's no, okay, right. you're, you're great who you are and how you are. And I think those two elements are, or those three elements, so realizing it yourself, finding the right people, if you can change the environment, I think these are three of the most powerful ways that you can do that. You see, you have to, you have to realize it first before you, let's say, if you want to distance yourself, because this is a huge step. And yeah. again, somebody, somebody can just say or think, Oh my God, my, my parents will not approve it. I have to, you know, and they just will be stuck and they will, they will not distance themselves. So the first they have to realize and then distance themselves and go to other city or country or whatever. And yeah, the, the first stage is definitely understanding that something is not quite right. And I want to do something about it. And again, this is not necessary. It's, and it's certainly not about blaming the parents or the other people. I don't blame my mother. She did what she did. My parents did what they did because that's what they thought was best. Right. They just wanted the best for me. You know, they loved, right. they cared for me. They wanted the best for me. But there was a, just a, a disconnect between what I actually wanted and what they wanted for me. So absolutely, Vlad, the realization that I want something different or this is what I want for me is the first step. And then the second step is creating a plan about what is the best way that I can go about creating an environment where I can thrive mm. for, for myself. I mean, you see, whatever happens, happened for best. You played out very well. You figure out who you are, <laughs> what you want to be. Absolutely. You know, they, they say that, you know, a kid's job is to, to grow up and, you know, deal with the shit that their parents left them. And that makes right. you who you are. Yeah. It's interesting that I would say, yes, my strict parents, my mother was very emotionally unstable. But then my sister and I have gone into very similar work whereby we look at helping other people deal with, with their past and make sure that we help them to be the best versions of themselves. So I think if I hadn't mm -hmm. gone through that, I wouldn't be doing the work right. that I'm doing now. And for me, I will always be somebody's biggest cheerleader because I know I didn't have that in my past. I want to move the conversation briefly to uh, the topic of conflict. Uh, since we, we start off the conversation talking about perfectionism, perfectionism, conflict and depression. Uh, so uh, this is obviously a very important aspect of leadership and personal growth. And it's often said that conflict is a necessary ingredient for innovation and change, but it can also be obviously incredibly draining. Uh, so there are some leaders uh, that shy away from conflict. They see it as a sign of failure or weakness or just, you know, major problem. How do you help them reframe conflict as a powerful 
tool for growth and innovation because i will i'll, I'll admit i tend to so vlad is very good with confronting conflict so you know, this is why we make a great pair because you know if there's a problem uh you know he'll typically yeah, deal, with it. deal with it yeah yeah and i i typically shy away from conflict i'm the very peaceful person and i i, I like to keep everything in order and you know uh, but in re in, in business especially and we've been doing this for 10 years uh it's not possible to stay away from conflict so if mm. i was a solo founder uh, we would have been in a, you know, <laughs> uh, we would not be where we are today. So conflict is extremely necessary, but I, I do admit that I, I, I tend to stay away from conflict. And I'm sure Vlad will agree, but how do how do you help reframe uh, leaders, uh, 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 see conflict in, in this light? So I'll ask, uh, if I, if I can, and I'll ask you a question. So what makes you shy away from conflict? It's a good question. You know, I typically never liked conflict, even in my personal relationship with my wife. We've mm -hmm. been together for 10 years. Uh, typically, we have very little conflict. I, I'm the one first to typically compromise uh, in mm -hmm. business. Probably the uh, it depends. Right. But typically, you know, uh, I, I, I will be the first one to come to the table to compromise, to keep the piece. Uh, mm -hmm. Why is it that? Why is it that way? Uh, I'm not exactly sure. You know, I've, I haven't done much. Uh, Per, uh, exploring back with my background, maybe perhaps it was my upbringing. Uh, but you know, I, again, it, it, we, you know, I grew up in a very tiny household. You know, my, my I, I love my parents; they did a fantastic job raising me. But obviously, you know, growing up with all of these different parameters can cause a lot of issues. And you know, I, I typically, I even in, as a child, I did not, I was never the one to create conflict. You know, so that mm. kind of stayed with me. Cool. I think you raise a, a really good point and everybody's conflict style or dealing with conflict is, is different. A lot of it is learned behavior from, from our, our childhood and just from, from what you shared mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, the high expectations of family, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, this was my modus operandi as well as I retreat from conflict or try and find right. peace, but then I'm not actually engaging. I'm giving up something of myself. So I'm not Correct. actually finding the best solution. I'm just appeasing which might Correct. be okay for the short term, but it's not necessarily the best way of dealing with conflict because conflict is generally just a difference of opinions. Uh, you know, I believe this, somebody else believes that. I believe this very strongly, you believe that very strongly. That's super cool. And as long as we don't get into a, a right versus wrong or good versus bad sort of conversation and we see it for what it is, somebody being very passionate about their viewpoint and somebody else being very passionate about their viewpoint, then we can come to a place where we appreciate different perspectives mm -hmm. and then think, okay, well, what is the outcome that we are actually looking at achieving here? You know, if you did happen to have an argument with your wife, it's like, okay, well, you know, you never leave your, you know, you never put your socks away in the, in the laundry or something. Right. And right. And you say, well, yeah, but you know, I don't like to, okay, well, what's the outcome? We want a clean home and how do we go about doing that? Except, I mean, it's probably a terrible example. I don't know why right. it comes to my head, but, um, <laughs> It's okay to have different perspectives. As you said, it brings out creativity. It bring, brings out innovation because everybody's right. hearing different viewpoints. But if we can then focus on, right, at the end of the day, what's the result we both want to walk away with and then do whatever it takes to get to that result. Mm. So, yeah, it's not a bad thing, but often we're framed by what we experience in our past. Yeah, no, I think you make a good point. It's, it's yeah, it, I, I think the most important takeaway is that at least for me in this conversation is you are, you, you tend to give up something with that, you know, you, you think you're compromising, but in reality, you are the one, or let's say me in this case, I am walking away from something. I'm the one who's losing a little bit to regain, uh, to keep the peace. And the, so the question ultimately becomes, you know, why are you doing that? How many things will you really give up? You know, and, and if this compounds over years and years and years, you know, how much have you really given up? So that's, these are these, that's, 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 you know, that, that's a powerful, that's a powerful realization. But also people don't like to go to have a conflict because not everybody wants to compromise. I mean, not, not two parties. If one is willing to compromise. And well, yeah, then we have the opposite gun, problem. Right. Yep. Another one is just strictly, no, it's my way on or no way, you know, then and and this is where it's tricky. Um, there's a modest uh, model of, of conflict, Thomas Kilman. Uh, it's a great way of visualizing. Okay, what are the different conflict styles, and how can we get to what we what we want to get to? But yeah, sometimes people say, okay, it's my way or the highway. In which case, then you need to think, okay, well, what is the best possible outcome from this particular situation? What am I willing to do, and what am I not willing to do? 
And then this comes down to setting and, and defining our boundaries as well. Hmm. But I had, a, I had an example of somebody I was working with at a previous company. We were talking mainly about work stuff. And then he was telling me about the relationship with his, with his wife and they would have many different conflicts. And he would just say, okay, cool, whatever. I'll just do what you want. Hmm. And I told him at the time that that's fine. It's not a sustainable strategy, though, to keep the peace uh, because resentment is going to build up because you feel like every time you're okay, you're doing what the other person wants. There, there is no mutuality in that mm. situation. And sadly, I don't want to say I was right, but lo and behold, I heard from somebody else that they're getting divorced. And I'm not saying that was the reason, but I have a feeling it was a contributing factor because if we always feel we are giving up something of ourselves, then it's going to get to a point where we don't want to do that anymore. That's a very good point. I want to move the conversation to authenticity. Now, mm -hmm. you know, this is, and this is come up. We've talked quite a bit with other guests as authenticity. This is a, this is a very, should I say a buzzword Vlad that's been around for a couple of years now, but it, it's it, for good reason. Um, can there be instances where somebody's being too authentic? And we're talking about in the business sense, right? Uh, because I, I believe being authentic is very important. Uh, but does is that always the good case where you know you're running a company with 200 employees and you're facing, you know, financial stress? Uh, you're not exactly sure if layoffs are happening now. Do you do you relay that information to your, to, to your team as kind as possible? But you know. What happens at that other end, right? Uh, for 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 the employees, it's like, oh man, great job, but okay, this is time to start job searching. Productivity might go down, X, Y, and Z. So, from a business point sense, you know, how authentic should leaders be? Another great and tricky question that I will say: it depends. It depends on the the outcome that you want in that particular situation. I think if you're going for the example that you mentioned. Okay, what, what outcome do I want as a leader for, for everyone in my organization? Okay, I want to make them aware of the situation, but maybe I want to make them aware that I'm doing everything in my power to ensure that things are going to go as smoothly as possible. Uh, but again, you know, leaders will go through these decisions all the time. I think it is important to be authentic because people can tell when you're yeah. bullshitting and when you're not. If you said, everything's fine, don't worry about anything, right. then that's probably not being authentic. If you said, okay, there's some difficult times coming up ahead. We know we've got the skills, the abilities, the attributes to weather this. All good. That's one way. Or <laughs> well, then you can say, okay, it's all awful. Everyone start, you know, prepping your CVs and looking for jobs. Each of those three are going to have different impacts and different results with regards to how you communicate things. I would say that, yeah, it's going to depend on the situation, the outcome, the results, and how you are as, a, as an individual as well. Because if people, yeah, if you are true. typically a really, you know, harsh leader, and then you try to start being super, I'd say harsh, that's probably not the correct word. Um, let's say a bit more stoic uh, as a right. leader. And you're then all sweetness and light. And oh, hey, Vlad, how's it going? I have not seen you. And you're thinking, hold on, this guy has not spoken <laughs> to me for four years. What is going that's on? That's about me. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> then, you know, there's going to be questions that are going to be asked. So the authenticity has to run with who you are as a person, but you then have to balance it with, I think empathy is a, is a critical Correct. component. This is, yeah. to me, authenticity with empathy. These are the two things that, that should go together because even if you're delivering difficult messages but delivering them with empathy, Correct. it's going yeah. to come across as authentic. You might even say something to me that I don't particularly like or I don't agree with, but if it's authentic and you've said it with empathy, then this yeah. is the perfect way to deliver a difficult message. Agreed. Isn't it also depends on the culture where your company is? Like, for example, U.S. versus Europe versus Asia versus Russia, the different also, styles of management everywhere. Shouldn't you adjust your authenticity to the culture? And we have experience with this. Yeah. <laughs> Again, I would say it depends because that's then a, then, so then a conversation. You know, if, uh, you know, I, I would say Vlad being, being of, uh, of Russian descent is more direct uh, which is something I really like. That's something I appreciated when I go to Russia, but sometimes, and then I think in Europe, the Dutch are very direct as well. Hmm. And so this is something that doesn't necessarily translate across to, to the U S but then it's a conversation between, you know, Vlad and myself, if Vlad is leading me, it's like, okay, either I might ask Vlad to tone it down or I might say, okay, cool. This is just him being direct. 
but this is how how he is and then i i mold and adapt my style to to working with him so it's it works on both ways i think yes you have to be conscious of cultural differences but then it's still a conversation around how we manage through those cultural differences i actually have a question about we spoke about the conflict so in your experience who handles conflict better women or men <laughs> that's, that's a funny such question. a casual <laughs> question that you throw in there it's like this is not going to cause any issues <laughs> if i answer one way or another <laughs> listen i i think that generally speaking women are more effective communicators than, than men they're just more adept because it's been shown in studies as well generally the emotional intelligence is a lot higher in in women if we if we generalize than than in men uh so i would say i would say that but it's going to very much depend on the situation their circumstances how they grew up their experience with conflict because then you have somebody who's you know a conflict negotiator for example is going to and and is a woman is going to have more experience than a conflict negotiator uh, sorry somebody who hasn't been a conflict negotiator yeah. and and vice versa so there's too many variables to to say safely <laughs> but how dare say, you ask that question vlad i i, I would i would say I, mean, I would say women but i would say women also Women definitely handle conflict better. And not only that, Vlad, and we, we know this. From, uh, actually, we, I shouldn't even say it because now if, if, if our team watches this, they'll, may, they might get offended. But I'll say it anyway. I'll be the authentic version of, uh, of myself. I, I actually, and, and I am. I, I'm, I'm always true to myself, and everybody knows me for this. But uh, what our, our team leads, when we have like uh, our, our department heads, we've always seen it. Women always are better project managers they are able to always uh under promise and over deliver every single time I, i'm not saying it's true for everybody I'm, I'm just giving you our personal experience and everybody on our team is fantastic regardless of their gender but we've uh, uh women just do uh, incredible i mean I I incredible I'm, I'm not saying that the men are far uh, far behind in any way but uh, Vlad, is that not true? <laughs> it is 100% true. But also, I remember seeing or reading somewhere, there are statistics that uh, women are better CEOs right now. And there are actually more women CEO becoming, I mean, nowadays, companies mm. hire more women CEOs than the men. Is that because true? It makes a difference handle... to the bottom line. There's, there's been many studies showing that having a diverse workforce makes makes a difference to the, to the bottom line. Yeah, for sure. And... That's just the data showing. Okay, whoever is watching this podcast, we are looking for new CEO for our company. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, well yeah, well, if you want to see, well, I might know someone. I, I always say this: listen, I mean, men don't have to give childbirth. Men don't have to, uh, you know, be on their period every single month. <laughs> All right, let's we'll get away from the conversation. But okay, I think I think the audience knows where where we're with this on this topic. But uh, regardless of the gender, we think everybody is fantastic. Uh, okay, Vlad, uh, you can continue. Yeah, uh, <laughs> let, let's move to the third part of the conversation, which is depression. Um, mm. I also was doing some digging and the research and found that the research was from, from the UK, uh, that 55% of people experiencing depression citing work as a significant contributing factor and yep. around, mm. around 900,000 employees suffer from work-related stress, depression, or anxiety every year. So given the stat, uh, what are some subtle signs you've observed that often go unnoticed in such environments? And how do you think we can better address and recognize these issues? Well, if they're subtle, it's, it's hard to recognize. But I think anything that we, we talked about, I think at the beginning of the conversation, you know, weight gain, weight loss, change in personal grooming, you know, how tired or alert somebody is looking, any changes in, in habits or so withdrawing socially, you know, just saying, hey, can't make that event or um, just things that in isolation may not mean very much. But I would just say, look out for any changes in behavior and just ask the question. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt to ask the question. The thing is, I would say with that, it sometimes, you sometimes need to ask the question several times. If you had asked me a question when I was suffering with depression, I, I don't think I had the language or I don't think I understood what was happening. Mm. And I think, at least in my case, it would have needed somebody to ask me several times for me to really maybe start having a conversation or actually trigger that awareness and that realization in myself. In, uh, in medium-sized companies to big-sized companies, do you think 
uh, they should have like a psychologist or a coach or how how do you call it? like this kind of person like on site performance site coach or perform or performance coach who always overseeing people and asking questions. Well, I mean, I would say yes because even though when I was embedded in in different organizations before, that's actually what I spent a lot of my time doing. So it mm. wasn't, let's say, my role officially, but I would still wander around and just go in and check in on people and just have conversations with them and see how they're doing. I think it's a really, if organizations inv invested in that, I think they'd see mm. a, you know, a massive shift in terms of just the conversations that people were having, just the awareness. Because I, I often think that there's I a agree. lot of pressure on leaders and, and managers. There's lots. There's so many expectations of what they have to do. And then also on top to think about, I think it's important to do, to think about the well-being and the mental health of all of the people that they lead. But then if you think the time that's generally allocated for leaders to be able to spend time on their people, right. it's not that much. Right. I would prefer that leaders would spend 70% of their time looking after people, checking in on them, just getting to know them, and then maybe 30% of the time doing the job, as opposed to, I think it's probably easily the other way around. It is. And so, yeah. I mean, having, especially having it's very hard at the beginning of the journey when you're just a couple employees and, you know, the founder of the company, he's a CEO, he's a marketing manager, he's everything. I mean, he can't possibly <laughs> go around and ask too many questions. Well, I think I think I think it's opposite, Vlad. I think when you're starting off, especially when we start off, uh, you have much more time uh, and it's much more, uh, you know, you, you give a lot more time and effort and energy to your team as opposed to now you know now you know, we have our we're over 50 plus team members right now and unfortunately as much as i hate to admit it yeah you're right that's that we don't spend as much time with our team members and having those conversations as we could but at the beginning we could now it's a lot of high level overview this and that and this launch and that launch and reading contracts and agreements uh right it's i mean yeah Okay, let me rephrase it. When you are too tiny, <laughs> you can do it. But when you are small, like we are, with 50 employees in, then it's kind of hard. But as you grow, maybe yeah. then you can, you know, just hire somebody else to oversee. It. But again, the more company grow, more problems and more. Companies. Yeah, You'll never have time. As, <laughs> as, as you said, if you, if you don't have the time, it's then much harder to see those small incremental changes that when you were small, you're seeing somebody all the time, you're seeing them every day, you're going to notice. Yeah. Whereas if you see somebody, you know, one month and then you only see them six months later, there might have been changes, there might not have been, but you're not going to remember necessarily unless it's super, you know, visible, but um, it might not be. It has to be like a habit from, right from the beginning. When you're small, tiny, you know, you have a habit of you know, communicating with people, speaking, asking them questions. And as you grow, probably mm -hmm. you'll just outsource it if you have it in your habit already. Yeah. And, and in which case, when you when you then have that, that meeting, it depends on how open and honest that person is going to be with you. If they know right. you've got half an hour with them and then you're not going to see them for another six months, they'll say everything right. is fine. I yep. mean, listen, if you had if you had saw me back when I was when I was struggling externally, you would not have said anything was wrong. I was still smiling. Mm. I was still, you know, outwardly fine and outwardly you know, daryl is always the happy guy but you know internally it was a completely different situation so i think as i said before just reinforcing having those conversations as a as a leader it is challenging but i would invite people in leadership roles just to check in constantly or consistently constantly um but that's the thing for me is don't cancel one-on-one -on -one meetings have them regularly and then you can build that level of trust because you have that consistency. And therefore, when you have that level of trust, people are more likely to be open about some of these things that are going well, but also not going so well. You just mentioned something that I think is, I want to touch a little bit more further on. Um, you mentioned that, you know, when you were depressed externally, nobody could, nobody could tell. Would you say that it was, so you're, so you're a high performer. It, there's a certain term for it. I, I don't know. What, high, what, functioning? I high, functioning, high functioning. High yeah, functioning. Yeah. High functioning. <laughs> uh, you have depression, but you're still high functioning. Is, is, is that correct? Was that for you? Uh, this is, this is it. So this is a very yeah. interesting, I, I kind of want to talk a little bit more about this because we had a great, great conversation with Dr. Rutherford who coined the term, or I believe coined the term perfectly hidden depression. 
and mm-hmm. we just I just had a conversation with her a couple months ago, and she stated that our kids, our kids, she, she's she thinks she strongly believes that we'll know every single person in about 20, 30 years will know someone that has killed themselves that had perfectly hidden depression. They had it all. We're looking, sure. you know, Daryl had no. Like, he was always happy. He was always, yeah. he had a job. He had a, perhaps a girlfriend or wh- whatever the case is, and then committed suicide. And this is actually very scary. Uh, I, I, I do want to, how do we, how do you identify? Because it's, it's extremely hard. You mentioned that externally, nobody can tell how, so that's, and it's very scary. And I, I this is, this is, this is getting more attention. And I think it deserves far yeah. more attention. This, this perfectly hidden sure. depression. I, I have on my own experience, my friend. We were we were going to college together, and then he went to UK, you know, to continue his master's degree, whatever. Everything was fine. Everybody was speaking with him. He was very nice, very energetic, positive, no complaints, never, you know, out of all our company of friends, he was the most positive guy. Then out of nowhere, his mom calling me, he's saying he suicide. Out of nowhere. And nobody knew, even mom, brother, nobody. He just, and oh, actually crazy. he called the day before to everybody was speaking nicely, you know, laughing and, and next day he's just gone. Yeah. That's, um, yeah. It resonates quite a lot, quite a lot with me. Hmm. Um, I didn't take it that far, but I certainly had, had thoughts, um, and took some actions along those lines, but never, never followed through. And I think this, um, you know, I think it ties with the perfectionism that you want everything to be fine. You have to present a certain image and then people, you know, if you present any other image, it, who are you? You know, it questions your whole identity. I can't be somebody that, you know, everybody else expects me to be that way. I can't be different to that. You know, I remember one time very early on as well, I, I was struggling. I think I just split up in a relationship and I, and I went to open up with to friends and say that I was struggling but I didn't feel very supported by them at that particular point in time. And then after that point in time, I thought, okay, well, there's nobody here to listen to me and to support me. I'm not going to do it again. Mm -hmm. And then I didn't for many, many years. And I think it's interesting, obviously with three men talking here, I think, especially for men, the biggest killer for for men between 18 and 35 is is suicide. And it's because I I remember also watching, um, I think a stream on, on or a, a video on TikTok uh, or on Instagram or something like that, where I think a woman was asking men, so who do you talk to when you struggle? Mm. And every single person that responds, to, I don't talk to anybody. I don't have anybody to talk to. And it's, yeah, a massive thing because there's just the inability, I think, for, for men to feel comfortable opening up. They don't know where to start. But also, as we talked earlier, just recognizing it in yourself and for it to be okay that you're struggling. So when it comes to, to, to leadership, I think there's, there's being vulnerable, saying that you messed up. And this starts, sort of starts helping to have these types of conversations that it's okay not to be perfect. It's okay to mess up. It's okay not to feel great. It's okay to feel upset. It's okay to feel stressed. And just to normalize those sorts of conversations, I think will help the, the broader topic that we're, we're talking about here. You know, I, w- I wonder where in life, you know, I also consider myself as perfectionism, as perfectionist at one, at one point, but I wonder when it became so that I don't give a fuck about being anymore, you know, the perfectionist. As long as, you know, you do MVP, let's say, in the business world, it's good enough to just start and then on the go you perfect it. I mean, that's, that's a great way of, of having it. So, yeah, I mean, it'd be interesting if you then come up with it to, to share, you know, what was that, that pivotal moment? Yeah, um, I need to that actually, allowed I, you I, to... I never, th- I never mm-hmm. were thinking about it. I need to mm-hmm. find out. Because I think that's, that's a great place also to, when you have conversation with other people, say, okay, cool. Well, you know, this is what allowed me to let go of that image that I had to have of myself that everything has to be great. I mean, in software development, as you know, then they take this iterative approach, which I really like. I think part of it for me was doing the mental health awareness, understanding that, oh shit, that's what that was. Mm-hmm. But then the software delivery life cycle of this iterations that it's okay to fail, to make mistakes. This is how we learn and we grow. And actually for me, I, 
I really liked. There was a point where uh, Elon Musk, they launched uh, SpaceX or something. Mm -hmm. And then they were expecting, I think, the two rockets to land or something. And then one rocket just completely got destroyed. And the media was rinsing him for it. And he just said, no, we've just got shit loads of data now of what right. doesn't work. <laughs> I thought, oh, that's pretty cool, actually. Somebody yeah. who has spent so much money, you know, they want to get it right. There was so much media attention expecting to get it right. And he just turned it into something completely different. I really, it allowed me to reframe, yeah, this whole notion of not having to, to be perfect. And I think that gave me some freedom around, it's okay. I, I know we, were, we our, our conversation started off with professional development and the corporate world and all that kind of stuff. And I know we're, we're digging into the personal stuff and kind of mixing. They're so, they're so close. And, they're, they're so they're closely so, linked, though. They're so closely you linked. You yeah. can't be, you know, you can't just be, you know, private and you know, professional. Yeah. They're so closely linked. And I think the willingness to have those sorts of conversations. I, I've seen this as well as uh, I remember having a conversation with the leader and they said, oh, this is what this person shared with me. And they felt so uncomfortable that somebody mm. had shared something that they were struggling with, that they came to me for assistance and support. But we need to get used to this because a lot of people, we spend a lot of time at work. And a lot of the issues, as Vlad, as you said, with one of the, the stats is because of the challenges that we face at work. So we just need to get comfortable having these types of conversations because the more comfortable we have the more it frees up our headspace then to focus on work achieve what we need to achieve be productive but at the same time feel like we're heard we're valued and we're, we're cared for in in a way that is meaningful i absolutely agree i i, I want to ask a question um i want to see what your thoughts are on this you know, we're talking about depression and we're talking about uh, we're talking about how of course perfectly hidden depression is also on the rise what are your thoughts and again i know for the listeners who are listening of course you know we're not subject matter experts in the question that i'm, I'm about to ask but uh, artificial intelligence has been of course a very hot trend we've seen large language modules like claude uh, from anthropic and chat gpt do you know an, incredible things um and so i and uh, there's a lot of people that are there that they are they have increased level of stress and anxiety they're not exactly sure what the job market will look like in 5 years or 10 years and we have these you know driverless taxis coming out and i we can argue that it's always been the case but now truly and as as a founder as a, a, as someone who's been doing this for 10 years who employs the people uh, who's who's made products? We serve over a million, million students nationwide. Uh, not to sound grim, but I mean, damn, these large language modules are damn impressive. And uh, right now in our organization, the people that use this, they have a, they are probably about three hundred percent more productive. So when I look at it in the long term, you know, maybe five years from now, when a team used to need ten designers on the team, they may only need three but now if companies start doing that all across you know and as a leader i'm worried myself as a leader i, I me personally i'm worried my, and we were just talking about this right flat i mean what we've been able to do our productivity has skyrocketed. we have mm. 304 percent 100 output per month on products we're able to do uh, just, it's, it's 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 incredible but at the same time as a leader as a founder i am worried in general for the masses and the general of you know how things will function because when we have perhaps mass unemployment or a certain group of people in society who cannot contribute to society effectively that's mm -hmm. very scary that is very mm -hmm. nobody should be hoping for that right we cannot yeah. have a class of uh, uh, of citizens in the united states will say that are quote unquote useless to society and that that, that kind of keeps me up at night personally i don't know why but i'm i, I you know i'm Again, I'm a very optimistic person usually, so I wanted to get your thoughts on that because we're talking about depression and this kind of, you know, this this can, yeah. like, is this where the the trend is? Are we going to see a much higher rate of uh, uh, depression come in as well because of all this going on? Again, we're, I know we're not experts here, so I, I, you know, whatever I say is just my feelings, obviously. So I I wanted to get your personal thoughts on this. Yeah, and I would say, I mean, that's you know, predicting trends is not an area of my my expertise as well. I I will say that. 
you have to control what you can control. There's this notion of controlling the controllables. I think a lot of the time when I was struggling in the past, it's because I'm thinking about what other people are thinking about me. I can't control right. that. And if we spend too much time trying to control things that we can't, then this is where we can mm. struggle quite a lot. So I need to narrow my focus and think, okay, what's in my sphere of control? And then also what's in my sphere of influence? Because those two things I, I can have an impact on. I can have a direct impact on my thoughts, my behaviors, my actions, my words. I can influence others through my words. I can tell them how I'm feeling. I can request, I can be curious, I can ask, I can you know, uh, manage that. But other things outside that, trends of what's happening in the market, jobs, right. all of these types of things, I, I have zero control over. And therefore worrying about all those types of things, I think, yes, will cause issues. And so I would then encourage people to try and scale back. Yes, you can think about those things, but if you're spending time worrying about stuff that you can't control, this is where you're mm. going to struggle with your mental health. This is very good advice. But also very nice, very good point. I think, strategy is to uh, convert your weaknesses into strength. So let's say you are afraid what other people will think about you. You can make it into your strength, no? So you will... It will it will uh, ignite your inner I don't know perfectionist whatever I mean call whatever you want but it it will improve your maybe output. How how will you? It depends. It depends. Yeah, that's hard. I think pe people are people are different. I for example, let's say people can have really strict parents, and like me, I was very obedient, and that turned me into a people pleaser and a perfectionist. Other people might say, well, fuck this. I'm going to go off and do what I want to do. So it's it's very much dependent on somebody's character. I don't think necessarily that purely focusing on your weaknesses is necessarily a good thing. Why would mm. you want to spend time on things that you don't particularly enjoy or you're not good at? I would mm. say it's better to focus on building your strengths, really focusing on the stuff that you enjoy, that energizes you, that you know that you can do, because that will just take you higher. I mean, these will follow and increase naturally over time. But I would say my take is focus on your strengths and what you're great at, because this is where you can leverage, uh, you can get the most out, basically. Uh, but in terms of, yeah, future, then it's also a question of adapting. I think AI is a tool, like all other tools, and it's just going to change the way in which we do things. Like some changes are inevitable. Again, this is worrying about it is, is pointless because it's there, it's here where we can't, you know, you can't close the barn door or, you know, put it back in the box or, or whatever. That's not going to happen. So it's now, how do we adapt with it? Uh, nobody knows what it's going to look like in five years, but I know that I can take control over my life and my circumstances and do the, the most that I can do to ensure that I'm in the, in the best possible situation going forward. Yeah, that I, I, this, I think that's very important. And that's advice that I should heed to you uh, that you just mentioned, which is, Stop worrying about things you cannot control. And uh, I love control. I mean, I love, you know, I mean, and Vlad knows this. And, I mean, I, like my mind just works probably not in the best way. I, I, uh, so, yeah, no, you, you should you should stop worrying about things that are out of your control. And I, yeah, that's that is like, that's the best advice. It's, it's I guess it's hard, a little hard to practice, but th that is the but best takeaway here because you can't, it's silly. It's silly. What, what, what should you be, you know? So, okay. So like, and, you know, I don't want to get too deep into this, but like in my brain, uh, like, you know, I'll do a lot of modeling, you know, like, uh, like modeling, meaning like, you know, like run like mathematical projections yeah. and like, right. I thought, flat, I, thought it's just like, I thought you meant fashion uh, modeling. Oh no, I, I, I wish. Say, that's, I wish. That, that, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, like, uh, uh, or uh, uh, forecasting or, you know, I'll run simulations of, what happens, you know, like how long do we have to, you know, how, how long can we survive to keep our engineering team on if this happened? And that, like the amount of simulations that will run through my head monthly on pure bullshit, again, like things you cannot control is a lot, which is really stupid because you cannot I control. I mean, the, the one thing is that if you're doing the simulations and projection and you enjoy it, I don't. I, uh, enjoy, enjoy no, it. no, because it's <laughs> it, it, it induces anxiety and fear. You know, it it doesn't help me go to sleep. Can you imagine? It's like, yeah, I I I fall asleep. You know, uh, with running numbers because it makes me really sleepy. No, it, it it's it's quite the opposite. But no, I again, I 
I think your point is uh, uh, your 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 advice is spot on. Stop with, trying with, to with worry. With regards to running the models, though, I'd say something different because you know what's the outcome that you're looking for. So I'm looking to predict or looking at gaining some level of predictability over our future market strategy. I want to see where the company is in the next six months, twelve months, eighteen months. There's nothing wrong with that to right. say, okay, cool. If I run these particular models, so this is a worst case scenario, this is the best case scenario, and this is kind of somewhat in the middle. Super cool. Right. I think that's an amazing practice. And I think every business owner would be mad not to look at, okay, some different metrics about what the future is going to look like. However, then the choice that you're making is to worry about it. Right. And then that, I would say, doesn't have a purpose. Running the models has a purpose then worrying about it or thinking more than you need to if that's right. a way of expressing something. I would say then there isn't a point to that because it doesn't have an outcome that is desirable. Whereas mm. the desirable outcome is to figure out what the engineering team is going to look like, what their needs are going to be, what their dependencies are, what the you know, what resources do we need for the next six, twelve, eighteen months. Mm. Great conversation. I we have a uh, a ritual here uh, on our podcast. Uh, at the end of every episode, we ask a question from our previous guest. So this get this this question is from oh, a, diary a of a CEO style. Ah, I like it. Uh, okay. And so this is from Dr. Sonia Chopra, who is uh, a dentist. And her question to you is: How often do you floss? Daily. Daily. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's I'm not a common answer. That is, is, not it, common is it really answer. not? It is no, not. No. no. So I struggled. Really I struggled to floss. I, I, I do water picks sometimes, but she said, this is bullshit. You have to floss. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, well, it's not I'm bullshit. Floss. It's great. But like you cannot. Let's say, so like I you use water floss it. like Vlad and we. And so I'll skip the flossing. You cannot oh, skip the floss. No, no, no. It's part so, of yeah, part of my can... routines. I think okay. routines are incredibly important. I mean, this is this is also something I, we, we didn't talk about it, but I remember making a note on it. So routines, something that helps to deal with uh, various parts of depression is to, to have, we talked about taking control over things, to so have small routines that you have control over. But mm. yeah, so I floss every evening, brush twice or three times a day, depending on, uh, on how I feel. Amazing. And Daryl, if you can ask any, oh, so not if you can, what is the question? You can ask any question you'd like to our next guest with no context. So please, what is the question that you would like to ask? Oh, no, I, I should really know what questions you have asked previously, but okay. <laughs> you can, you can tell me if this question has been asked. Sure. Uh, if you weren't doing what you are now currently doing, what would you have been or what would you have liked mm. to have become? I love that question. We did not ask that. So we will certainly take that. Uh, Daryl, this has been a wonderful conversation. I would uh, please, so please let our audience know and please let us know what you have going on, where we can find you, any interesting projects you have going on. Please do share. Uh, they can find me. I mean, I can give you the, the, the web details. You can either find me on, on LinkedIn. I can give you a website detail or uh, on Instagram. Instagram is my new thing. I quite like. Uh, did you say you've seen my my videos there, Vlad, or on, on LinkedIn? I've seen it on LinkedIn. Okay. Yeah, it, I, I I hated social media last year, and then this year I seem to really enjoy it. I really like being on camera. It's, uh, it's another so what part about, of being CEO of your own of your own business. <laughs> you have to love your, your social. Yeah, you, you have to love all things. Yeah, um, and I have a little project. Uh, I say a little project project with a building called the Little Things, all about the love languages. All this, the little things you can find that on Instagram. But yeah, my main things: uh, group coaching, one-to-one -one coaching. So if people want support uh, with leadership, building their confidence, their communication skills, or their leadership skills, then they can get in touch. I'd be happy to help and support. Thanks so much. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you.